We are ADL, or the Anti-Defamation League, and our mission is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. And what that really means is that as an organization, we are combating hate and bias in all the forms that it's manifesting today in society and uh, combating how the polarizing forces are pulling people apart. So we're working to uh, bring communities back together, um, address hate as it is as it is a serious problem in our society today. We're here today for our 17th annual Unity Through Understanding Day and it's a day where we bring high school sophomores together uh, to learn our anti-bias, anti-bullying programming, uh, to learn how to stand up for one another as allies. We bring educators in with them. Um, we have several dozen schools represented here today, about 150 attendees. It's a wonderful day where we partner with Loyola Law School. Holocaust education is important because if we don't teach the next generations what happened, there's that fear that it can happen again. It's important that we don't relive um, some of the catastrophe that we've seen before. And I think it's so important. I know as a Jewish parent, it has always been part of my students, my, my child's life. and their friends' lives. But what you find is there's so many students that don't know anything about it and it's so a part of history that if we don't continue to tell the story, it's going to be missing from the history books. Buchenwald. In an official report forwarded from Supreme Allied Headquarters, this camp is termed an extermination factory, containing ovens having a maximum disposal capacity of about 400 bodies per 10-hour day. All bodies were reduced to bone ash. The Buchenwald camp was founded when the Nazi party first came into power in 1933 and has been in continuous operation ever since. Its largest populations date from the beginning of World War II, and among the inmates are listed leadership personnel from all of Europe. When the Americans took over on 10th April, some 20,000 were all that remained of the camp's normal complement of 80,000. But more terrible still were the concentration camps, which from the beginning had been the conspirators' chief weapon against opposition of every kind. German anti-Nazis were the first victims, but with the war their numbers swelled to include citizens of all the nations of Europe. Their fate is described by witness Rudolf Hess. I commanded Auschwitz until the 1st of December 1943 and estimate that at least two and a half million victims were executed and exterminated there by gassing and burning. At least another half million succumbed to starvation and disease, making a total dead of about three million. Included among the executed and burned were approximately 20,000 Russian prisoners of war who were delivered at Auschwitz in Wehrmacht transports. The remainder of the total number included about 100,000 German Jews and great numbers of citizens from Holland, France, Belgium, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Greece and other countries. Medical experiments, too, were standard procedure at many concentration camps. These included lowering the body temperature to 28 degrees centigrade, high altitude tests in pressure chambers, experiments with poisoned bullets and contagious diseases, and even sterilization experiments. This was genocide, the premeditated destruction of entire peoples. Genocide, the 
direct result of the Nazis' claim that they had the right to destroy the party's opposition. Tomorrow the world, dead or alive. In the name of the French Republic, Monsieur de Monton closes counts three and four, the final charges of the indictment. All the defendants committed crimes against humanity, including the murder and persecution of all people opposed to the Nazi party, and the enslavement, exploitation, and deportation of civilian populations. The slave labor policy was the responsibility of defendant Sokol, who admitted in 1944, out of the five million workers who arrived in Germany, not even 200,000 came voluntarily. Forced labor often meant brutal and degrading treatment, for Sokol himself suggested. All the men must be fed, sheltered, and treated in such a way as to exploit them to the highest possible extent at the lowest possible expenditure. And defendant Bormann added, the Slavs are to work for us. In so far as we do not need them, they may die. Slavery was only one aspect of Nazi exploitation. Defendant Goering, in a talk with German occupation authorities in 1942, discussed another, plunder. God knows you are not sent out to work for the welfare of the people in your charge, but to get the utmost out of them so that the German people can live. This everlasting concern about foreign people must cease now, once and forever. I have here before me reports on what you are expected to deliver. It makes no difference to me in this case if you say that your people will starve. But Nazi crimes against humanity were not limited to foreign peoples. Defendant Frick, as Minister of Interior, directed a program aimed at aged, insane, or incurable Germans, the so-called useless eaters. Thousands were committed to special institutions. Few ever returned. Evidence proves they were murdered because they were useless to the plans of the Nazi conspirators. But perhaps the greatest crime against humanity the Nazis committed against the Jews, a campaign of hate and murder that goes to the heart of the Nazi movement. In this barn at Gardelegen near the Elbe, a mass murder was perpetrated by SS troops. 1,100 prisoners were burned and machine gunned to death just prior to the entry of American troops. Only a few managed to survive, and on 19th April, they hear a curt order delivered to the citizens of Gardelegen who marched to the cemetery carrying shovels and wooden crosses. At the points of bayonets, if necessary, the army decrees, they will dig individual graves for each of the 1,100 slave laborers and political prisoners. Each grave will be six feet long, six feet deep, and three feet wide. The slave labor camp at Nordhausen, Germany, liberated by the 3rd Armored Division, 1st Army. At least 3,000 political prisoners died here at the brutal hands of SS troops and pardoned German criminals who were the camp guards. Some 2,000 are still alive, and many of them, too weak to move, lie amid the dead where they managed to survive on the meager rations. Nordhausen has been a depository for slaves found unfit for work in the underground V-bomb plants and in other German camps and factories. These human skeletons are mainly Poles and Russians, with considerable numbers of French and other nationalities also included in the camp roster. American medical crews evacuate the survivors. They will be treated in Allied hospitals.
The Burgermeister of Nordhausen is ordered to provide 600 German male civilians who will inter the 2,500 unburied bodies at the camp. Most of the victims had been imprisoned for as long as five years, starved and beaten to death or machine gunned by SS troops. A concentration camp near Leipzig where 220 prisoners were burned to death. They were lured into a mess hall on the pretense of being fed. The building had been sprayed with an inflammable liquid and SS guards applied the torch. The dead men shown in frozen positions are those who were mowed down as they fled the burning structure or electrocuted by the live wires of a fence which was the final hurdle for those fleeing the flames. The Leipzig victims were Russians, Czechs, Poles and French. The dead are viewed by Russian women liberated from slave labor. Nazi concentration camp at Holzen, Germany. It's one of seven found in this area by the 83rd Division, 9th Army during the drive to the Elba. Some of the prisoners photographed on 8th April are badly beaten, others diseased and emaciated. Of the 350 at the camp, 140 are Jews. The remainder identify themselves as Russians, Poles, and Czechs. 75% were imprisoned for alleged acts of sabotage. Lice and other vermin infest the camp. The Nazis confined the prisoners to a diet of potatoes. In Hadamar, Germany, a war crimes investigation team arrives at a Nazi institution seized by First Army troops. Under the guise of an insane asylum, this has been the headquarters for the systematic murder of 35,000 Poles, Russians, and Germans sent here mainly for political and religious considerations. First to appear before Majors Fulton Vowell and Hermann Bolker, is Adolf Merkel, records clerk for the Hadamar Institution. He gives testimony confirming the liquidation of Poles and Russians. Next to appear are Dr. Valman, head of the institution, and Carl Willig, chief male nurse, who admits to killing inmates with overdoses of morphine. The testimony of other witnesses substantiates the fact that morphine was issued at the institution without attempt at making a record. As many as 17 at a time died from the morphine injections. The investigating officers are told that the Nazis never bothered to determine whether a victim may have survived the overdosage. Instead, all were hustled off to the graveyard and buried in piles of 20 to 24. Meanwhile, at the graveyard attached to the institution, bodies are exhumed for autopsy. 20,000 are buried here. 15,000 who died in a lethal gas chamber were cremated and their ashes interred. Men of the WCIT arrived to examine the corpses. Major Bolker performs the autopsy. A detailed listing is made of all clinical data. A Hadamar judge told the investigators that when the 10,000th victim died, the institution heads and Nazi officials staged a celebration. Political prisoners shot by Nazi troops before the arrival of General Patton's 4th Armored Division in the Gotha area. At this concentration camp near Ordruf, Germany, the Germans starved, clubbed, and burned to death more than 4,000 political prisoners over a period of eight months. A few captives survived by hiding in the woods. They state that the last batch of victims, numbering 150, were executed less than 24 hours prior to the entry of 4th Armored Elements under Colonel Hayden Sears. On 7th April, Army trucks arrived with a group of German civilians from the Ordruf area. They are to be taken on a tour of the campsite by Colonel Sears. A German officer wearing the Red Cross armband also is invited to view the atrocities. First, they see the bodies of those murdered by the Nazis because they were too ill to accompany them in their retreat. Next, to the shed where the dead are stacked in layers and the stench is overpowering. All are told they must enter. These two are identified as slave labor bosses who maltreated, tortured, and killed their workers. The taller man protests that he's innocent and that this is a propaganda demonstration arranged by the Americans. 
Now to the crude crematory where 4,500 prisoners are believed to have been disposed of. Ashes, arms and legs and charred bodies remain as evidence. The story of the atrocities is read for the visitors. The victims are said to include Poles, Czechs, Russians, Belgians, Frenchmen, German Jews and German political prisoners. General Eisenhower suggested that a group of congressmen and editors be sent to Germany to make a first-hand report on the concentration camps overrun by Allied armies. Defendant Frank, Nazi governor of Poland, was another of the conspirators guilty of directing mass murder. In his diary, he speaks of taking advantage of the focus of attention on the Western Front by carrying out wholesale liquidation of thousands of Poles. These atrocities were not restricted to the East. Here is the proof in the village of Oradour sur Glane, France. town of Bonn, Belgium. Here is the proof in the San Callisto Caves, Italy, where 350 hostages were carefully listed systematically murdered. And here is Lidice in Czechoslovakia. In blind retaliation for the assassination of SS man Heydrich, the Nazis murdered all Lidice's men and sent their women and children into slavery in Germany. But this was not enough. Boys of the Arbeitsdienst were moved into the ruins of Lidice and ordered to level the village to the ground. be the Nazi's example to all occupied peoples. 1,200 civilians brought from the neighboring city of Weimar begin a forced tour of the camp. There are many smiling faces and according to reports, at first the Germans act as though this were something staged for their benefit. Then the evidences of horror, brutality and human indecency are shown. the parchment display. On a table is a lampshade made of human skin. Large pieces of skin have been used for painting pictures, many of an obscene nature. There are two heads which have been shrunk to one-fifth their normal size. These and other exhibits of Nazi origin are shown to the townspeople. The camera records the changes in facial expressions as the Weimar citizens depart. This concentration camp was the first one to be visited by the ten-man American Congressional Party. At the Ordruf camp near Gotha, Germany, General Dwight D. Eisenhower and General Omar N. Bradley had a high command inspection of the site where over 4,000 political prisoners were murdered in eight months. This camp was liberated by General Patton's 3rd Army troops. 
American congressmen invited to view the atrocities were told by General Eisenhower, the barbarous treatment these people received in the German concentration camps is almost unbelievable. I want you to see for yourself and be the spokesman for the United States. My mother, it wasn't particularly her, but one time some, some of the people at her camp tried to run off, and so the Nazis made all of her barracks and the others go outside in the, in the snow with no shoes on, just a very light clothing. It was, you know, it was usually freezing there in Europe in the winter with their hands up, and they couldn't do any. They had to stand there all night like that, and they had to watch them shoot the 10 guys that, uh, yeah, yeah. My mother's sister um, had gotten married right before all this. She was quite a bit older than my mother, and my mother and her had to witness her one-day-old baby being thrown against a wall and killed. And that my mother said that my, um, and I'm trying to give you these stories so that you can see what was going on during this time. These are real stories. When, when people say today that this has never happened or whatever, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense. But when, when we follow hate, this is, these are the kinds of things that can happen. In the very early 40s, rumors began to circulate in Brussels that Jews were beginning to disappear. Most Jews, unfortunately, did not pay attention. However, my father did. And he engaged the help of the resistance to find places to hide his family. He did not want to hide the family together. His thought was, probably, his thought was, if, well, if they catch one, they're not going to catch everybody. So somebody should stay alive. When I was three, my father brought me to this private home, a, a woman's home. She answered the door, a stranger. And apparently this woman had contacted the underground in saying that she was going to, she was willing to hide a Jew. So somehow or other between the resistance, contacting her, my father brought me to this house. Uh, she was a woman alone. There was no one else in that house. And I lived in that house for two years. Understand that I was never allowed to go outside to play. The reason being her neighbors knew she didn't have a little girl. So therefore, I had to stay indoors. I had no friends. I had no toys. So that was, that was my life for two years. When my father brought me there, that was the last time I saw my father. And all of this happened only because we were Jews. The, the thought, in my mind anyway, the thought that I was denied my father was simply because we were Jews. He had never done anything to anybody. He had never committed a crime. None of us had committed crimes. But six million were exterminated or killed simply because we were Jews. And one and a half million were children. Can one person make a difference? Yes. Absolutely one person. That's all it takes is one. One to say no. Just one. One person to say no to somebody else whose thoughts are negative about anything, about the color of one's skin, the religion of one another. No, 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 no. Thank you all for your very courteous yes. attention. Indeed. And thank you, Janine. You're welcome. The message is 
primarily that no one should forget what has happened. No one, in my estimation, has a right to forget. And when I go, when I die, there will be no more survivors. I'm a young survivor because I was a child survivor. And so it is up to these young people to carry on with the, with the stories that they've heard and because it's, it's so important and now anti-Semitism is growing so rapidly. I never thought that I would ever, ever see in America that Jews would be killed praying in a synagogue. That was the most frightening thing I've ever seen aside from my, what I went through. And it, it just, I cannot comprehend that this could be happening again, and it, it can't. It, it just must never happen again. And the only way it can be done is for me to keep telling my story and then for the kids to remember, and they that will then follow at me. Everything I heard today was so impactful, and it taught me that you shouldn't make assumptions about someone based on what they look like or their religion or their sexuality because in the end you find out that you have so many similarities between you and we're all in this life game together. It really showed me that we're all the same because you hear all these stories about things that are tragic like this and people like humans in general have a tendency to kind of not want to hear about it they just want to hear the good I have the tendency at least to try and only listen to the good I never want to read the news because things like this like they shock me because I don't know how people could be so heartless I mean a child getting like trying to be killed in the Holocaust is just terrible and I think that it's important that everyone knows about this because it's Everyone needs to know about the good and the bad in the world so that it won't repeat itself. Like you hear the term history repeats itself, it's because it's 100% true. You need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. I thought she spoke very beautifully. I think she spoke um, towards why we need to keep the stories of the Holocaust alive and why we need to make sure it can't happen again. What I learned here today was honestly really important and I feel that all kids should understand that no matter their age or what they look like, they can make a difference in the world if they to simply speak up about it. I knew that this was going to be, that this was going to be an effort in changing the world for the better. And I learned coming here that many of the experiences I faced, like as far as like discrimination goes, as far as prejudice goes, I'm not alone in, and many other people have experienced as well. And that I have more power to change things than I realize. I think hearing her story from such like a young perspective and kind of being separated from her family for so long was very impactful. I couldn't imagine my life like that. It was very impactful indeed and it made me reflect upon what could we do as a society and what we could do in our own community because a lot of what she said really touched me in a way and made me reflect about things I've heard before, things I've saw before and just made me, just gave me the strength to do more in the future. I think that her story is very important and it has an impact on students and that it needs to be continued to be spread around because it needs to stay alive and it can't be lost and forgotten. Well, from what I've heard today, it was interesting to hear the story of the Holocaust from a younger um, point of view. Like she said like she was only like, like she was really small and she was hidden for two years as a small child and had to like make her own toys and her own friends and like she she understood why she had to do it, but it's still as a child to be that isolated has to be pretty hard. And um she she told it in a way where like you felt like you were living it with her because she explained it in a lot of detail. I was honestly, like, in school we don't learn as much about what people experienced during the Holocaust. We just learn what it is, what happened, but not, like, how it impacted the lives of someone, like, who we talked to today. And it was just so hurtful to hear, like, what happened to their families what, and their life after the Holocaust. I thought it was very moving. It's different whenever you learn it in school. If you're able to put a personal story and a face to that, I really think it helps you understand the situation in a different way. 
I learned that people had to be um, hopeful and hardworking to be able to adjust to this new world and that also we should follow their example. We as people and especially the youth should be active and knowledgeable throughout the world around us so that we aren't doomed to the same fate as others and to things such as the Holocaust. This is our way of like better ensuring a world for ourselves, a present and a future for us and the next generation. It is important because they need to know how a group of people, like just because of what they believe in and their race, that they were sent to camps for no reason but just because one person wanted to do it. I learned about how hard it was to acclimate into normal society after the horrid events of the Holocaust, especially if you have to go from a concentration camp or ghettos into uh, the real world with no home, money, or family to speak of. I also learned how important it is to teach kids to have an open heart and an open mind so that they learn not to hate people just because they're different. Today I learned that the Jewish people, they, it, it's, it was all a big blame game and that they didn't really do anything wrong. Hitler like wanted to uh, like, say that Jewish were evil because he was like a really bad person, but like I learned that to not like give up because people in the Holocaust like they didn't give up and they got through it and didn't like really look at their past and just worried about the future. Well, I would make friends with all races still and I would stand up for what I know and I support. I'm gonna remember to um, respect the history of the German, of the Jewish and Germans and um, take away that uh, everybody is equal in the community and um, nobody should feel like they should be left out um, because of a race or something of their beliefs. The Nazis were not really any nice people. They killed for the fun of it and destroyed people's lives and ruined it mostly. It's made quite a lasting impression to like treat others like better than you know than others would like than other people would if they were to be bullied and stand up for other people. I think it's very important to teach our children the Holocaust education with social justice and civil rights all mixed into that. Um, there's no place for hate in schools. There's no place for hate in our world. And it starts with the kids. If we can teach those kids how to treat one another with respect, we're going to create a peaceful world. And that's what's the most important to me. I'm in my 15th year of teaching. And I, we incorporate through our propaganda unit how uh, propaganda can be used and how Hitler used propaganda to go from an elected official in three months to a dictator. And how our purpose for it is to make sure that these students, as they grow and they mature and they become voters, that they do not fall for the same type of propaganda. When students come in my classroom, they don't understand anything about the Holocaust. They have a little bit of understanding about World War II in general, but the Holocaust itself is a whole different animal. I use the diary of Anne Frank as the catalyst in my classroom to introduce Holocaust education and go from there using all kinds of other curriculum and all kinds of testimonies from Holocaust survivors and their families. Uh, the students have to know these stories because they're, they're uh, not available anymore as our Holocaust survivors have begun to die. They're so old and we have to teach these stories so that our world is not filled with hate and we don't have genocides and mass murders. We have to understand one another. A lot of it is being forgotten as many of our survivors are passing away and but they don't realize it really wasn't that long ago. There are people still living that went through these atrocities and if we don't know about them, if we don't know how they came to be, they will be repeated. One advantage of requiring that Holocaust be taught in every school is that we can only reach a small number, even though we have a full theater every year, two days every year, to show our film, to listen to our speakers. Think of all of the students who can't come here, who can't get a field trip, or whose teachers just can't take the time off of school. If they're required to teach it and they are provided with the right curriculum, they can teach within their classroom and reach all of Louisiana students. 
I've been teaching for 19 years and I teach about 50 students a year in my school. That's just a fraction of the students in Louisiana in the world. We've got to mandate this education for Holocaust studies in our schools so we can reach more. I think it definitely should be taught and it shouldn't just wait to that brief section of um, World War II in high school. It should be taught as a whole unit so that students have a better understanding because if they can't relate to it personally, it's not going to mean anything to them. Like my students, I assign them an actual identity of a person in the Holocaust and they find out at the end of the unit if they lived or if they perished. And we say those names and we remember those individuals and what they went through. What a treat to have uh, a voice of experience tell us her story. Um, this is something that uh, we need to treasure the living links that we have and we need to make sure that these stories aren't lost with time and that we need to make sure that people understand what happened during the Holocaust and to make sure that we do the things to uh, just to make sure that it never happens again. Never again means never again. It is so vital in education. It's so, it's such a big part of our history, of history of, of the United States, of the world. And I don't, I don't understand what the problem is. I, I was just made aware that Anne Frank has been taken out of the curriculum. How, how is that possible? I don't understand the mentality of the school system. I just don't understand. Every time you put on the news, there's some new anti-Semitic event that has happened. And just when you think that you can take a, a breath of relief as a Jewish person in the community, you realize there is no sacred safe place anymore. And so we constantly have to be aware of our surroundings. We have to. Uh, make sure that we keep each other safe and that we feel comfortable in who we are and where we are. All kids should learn because uh, it was too bad of an event for us to happen again, for it, us to let it happen again. Um, I'm a direct descendant of a Holocaust survivor, so I understand what they went through and why it needs to be prevented. All kids definitely should learn about the Holocaust because unfortunately it is a real event that happened in history and in order to prevent something that bad happening again, you must teach kids about it and make sure they know what not to do and how to make the world better. All kids should learn about the Holocaust because there's the danger of it happening again if, if hate goes unchecked. We have to do all we can to stop prejudice at, in any way possible. I think all kids should learn about the Holocaust because um, it's too much of a disaster to forget. Like, it cannot be forgotten. All kids should learn about the Holocaust because it is our history. It is something we can never forget, and it is something that all students in this country and around the world should learn because it could impact, well, impact them in so many different ways and it could really lead to a better and more just and fair society. It's a very important part of history that cannot be forgotten. In all the people in the world and these horrible things that happen, it shouldn't happen again. I think we should take more consideration into the history of the Holocaust and the survivors that are left and really hold on to their stories because like she said, we need to carry this on so it doesn't happen again and I think that's a problem with a lot of the kids these days, I'm talking like I'm old, but it's like we don't want to listen to our elders, we're like we want to do our own thing but like history, history is always the future and you can always find a way to prevent that. All kids in Louisiana should learn about the Holocaust because it cannot happen again. We already have so many things going on that like anti-Semitism still happens here and we don't want it to happen again. We cannot have such a mass genocide, anything like that ever occur again. I think that kids have a lot of power in having social media and you know access to that medium and so I think that we should be able to use that in order to spread the messages that we need to. All students should learn about the Holocaust because it is our reminder of what happens when we let ignorance and um, ignorance take charge and when, whenever we decide to hate people just because they're different and because we're not the same. All kids should learn about the Holocaust because it teaches you about, how, about the horrible effects of discrimination against other people. It's taking discrimination to an extreme that you would think wouldn't have happened, but it did and it's really important that that never gets repeated. All kids should learn about the Holocaust because it's really important to know what happened in our history 
and they can take away some things from it and apply it to their real lives. All students should learn about the Holocaust because it will help them be grateful for what they have. All students should learn about the Holocaust because it to teach another generation about the terrors that happened during the Holocaust and to prevent another one from happening again. All kids should um, learn about the Holocaust because it is a part of our world history and um, really we need our world history to help our future become brighter and if um, we don't learn about this and if the, our generation doesn't learn about this, um, it can happen again and um, we need this part of history to make sure it doesn't happen again. There's so many lessons from the past, right? The famous saying is those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Well, we can never forget what happened. And as we see the statistics coming out of, uh, you know, the majority of students being unable to identify what Auschwitz is or, um, you know, these, the, the loss of understanding of the historical lessons of the Holocaust makes us very vulnerable to a situation where, um, where we may, uh, we may see normalized violence or we may see targeted discrimination in ways that let t lend towards violence or even the possibility of, of pressures towards genocide in other places. And as, as we put systems of education in place to make sure that students understand the warning signs and what to do to combat them, um, those are critical for us coming together as a society and making sure that that hate-based violence leading towards genocide is not something that we ever see again. Holocaust education p should be required to be taught in the public schools because if we don't teach the next generation, it will happen again. Louisiana should teach the Holocaust in the public schools because it is of vital importance. It is vitally that they know and learn what has happened. Well, there's a lot of information out there, but from ADL, just go to ADL.org and do a search for Holocaust education. They can find more information on our website at JewishBR.org.